this is one I think that our agronomy day has probably really been built on is it's really the weed and uh, herbicide update so Kurt Vollmer is our extension uh, weed specialist and we get to drag him around to all kinds of farms and look at things and he's done a really good job so Kurt's going to give us a update on some of the things he's been doing and we have some workshops you'll talk about that and so Kurt I'll turn it over to you thanks for being here today so to start off today, I'm just going to give a quick update on a few new, newer herbicide products that are available or hope, hope to be available. Um, the first product is actually a, one for sorghum. It's called uh, First Stat. It's uh, Quisalifop, a grass herbicide, uh, something you really need for, you know, grass control and sorghum. We've got problems with, you know, foxtails, fall panicum other stuff that's hard to control on the grass crops. So um, this particular herbicide will allow you to do that. The only catch is you do have to plant a specific variety called Double Team Sorghum to do so. Uh, the next new herbicide I'll talk about is Acuron GT from Syngenta. Uh, this is a mixture of dual uh, Callisto uh, bicyclopyrone as well as a glyphosate and it's labeled for post-emergence in glyphosate tolerant corn. Uh, it gives you that control with glyphosate along with you know, the residual control of the dual, the Callisto, and the bicyclopyrum. Now, speaking of Acuron and Acuron products, Syngenta has come out with a lot of Acuron products in the past couple of years, and they all have different names, but they're all Acuron products, so this can be a little bit confusing depending on what you want to put out. So I've made this table to kind of help illustrate the differences between those products. All Acuron products will contain these three herbicides, bicyclopyrone, mesotrione or Callisto, and esmetolaflor, no matter what, whether it's straight Acuron, Flexi, or GT. Now, Acuron, straight Acuron also contains atrazine. Acuron Flexi does not contain any atrazine, and Acuron GT doesn't contain any atrazine, but it does contain glyphosate. So just be aware of what you want to put out and what's in these products if you do choose to use Acuron. And these Acuron products are also similar to some of Syngenta's other products, your Halex GT, your Lexar, and your Lumax. Um, basic difference between Acuron and Halux and Lexar and Lumax is this bicyclopyrone, which is not included in any of these products. Again, Halux GT, Halux glyphosate tolerant, does have that glyphosate in it. Uh, Lexar and Lumax both have atrazine, mesotrione, and esmetolaflor. A lot of companies have been tank mixing um, effective post-emergence products with good residual products. For example, there have been some new group 15 products like Esmetolaflor Dual come out with those group 27, those HPPD inhibitors, those bleaching herbicides for weed control in corn. Among these being Coyote, Imperos, and Restraint. Um, Coyote is a mixture of dual and Callisto, uh, Imperos is dual and another HPPD, dual and Shieldex, and Restraint is a mixture of Warrant and Shieldex. Uh, soybean products and burn down products. Uh, Reviton has come out with a new burn down product called, or Helm Agro, excuse me, has come out with a new burn down product called Reviton. Um, this is actually a, a new active ingredient, a group, but it's not a new site of action. It's a new group 14, a PPO inhibiting herbicide. Uh, again, non-selected burn down for corn, soy, and wheat. Uh, there is a 14-day uh, restriction to planting before soybean, but none if you use it before corn or wheat. Um, generally, in our soybean pre-programs, we recommend putting out a uh, a group 14 herbicide plus something like Metribuse and Metricor and a group a 15 or a group 3 herbicide. Um, two new tank mix products with those types of chemi chemistries have uh, been recently released. Um, Antares is complete from Helena is a mixture of sulfentrazone, Spartan, uh, Metribuzin, and Dual. And Kyber is a mixture of Valor, Metribuzin, and 
Zijua. Uh, both are labeled for pre-plant and pre-emergence in soy. Um, if you do it for Kyber, there is a seven to 30 day planting restriction for uh, pre-plant in corn. Another new soybean product from Syngenta is Tendovo. It's a mixture of dual uh, Metricor, Metribuzin, and first rate, uh, labeled for pre-plant uh, PPI and pre-emergence in soybean, as well as another tank mix product from UPL of a good, uh, effective post-emergence herbicide with a residual um, Liberty uh, plus dual or interline uh, plus moccasin labeled for uh, basically everything in soy, pre-plant, pre and post-emergence in soy. Herbicide shortages, Paul already alluded to this. Um, with everything that's going on with Bayer and the shipping issues, we were expecting some severe shortages of glyphosate and glufosinate products and some moderate shortages of Paraquat, 2,4-D, Dicamba, Atrazine, and Prow. So with that in mind, our weed management focus has to shift because we're gonna have to kind of plan on what we can get and what we have and how we can use the particular chemistries available to optimize our weed management program. So with that in mind, you really, really need to scout and know our field histories. Um, know what weeds are, have been in your field in the past and just don't rely on a single post-emergence program for weed management. Implement an effective herbicide programs. How can I get the most weed control out of the chemistries and the methods I have available? Integrate a non-chemical tactics. Just don't rely on your herbicide program for your weed management and manage escaped weeds, especially in situations like where you have uh, Palmer amaranth. So herbicide resistant weeds, our four main driving species in Maryland still remain Italian ryegrass that's resistant to our group one, our grass herbicides, our group two, our ALS inhibiting herbicides, and some populations that I suspect may be resistant to glyphosate. Mare's tail, nothing's changed there, still resistant to ALS inhibitors and glyphosate. Uh, common ragweed, um, resistance to um, our ALS inhibitors, our first rate, raptor synchrony, group nine, glyphosate, and some of our group 14 herbicides like fomesifen reflex. And this especially is a concerning problem with soybeans where, again, I said we do recommend using a group 14 herbicide in our burn down. And, when it, and group 14 is one of the only effective pre-emergence sites of action against common ragweed. And then finally, there's Palmer amaranth, which thankfully we only still only have resistance to just their ALS inhibitors and glyphosate. Um, I've said this before, other, uh, in other parts of the country, uh, Palmer amaranth is resistant to at least eight to nine other sites of action, modes of action, and this includes things like glufosinate, uh, Callisto, 2,4-D, and Liberty. So uh, make, be sure that if you do have Palmer amaranth, um, you're getting rid of all of it in your weed control program. So again, different weeds. Those four species are going to be our driver species, but there's other weeds out there besides Palmer. And different weeds, again, means there's not going to be any type of silver bullets. So, and Alternative herbicides aren't going to control as many weeds as glyphosate. Glyphosate is still a good herbicide. It does very good against both broadleaf and grass weeds. But when you think about all of your other post-emergence products, you know, glufosinate, some grasses it works on, some grasses it doesn't. 2,4-D doesn't work on grasses. Dicamba doesn't work on grasses. Um, your ALS inhibitors really depends. So tank mixtures are likely going to be needed to provide effective control of these different weed populations. And it's going to be important to, again, scout fields multiple times. Um, your scouting records are really going to help you prioritize when, what herbicides you use. If you have glyphosate or glufosinate, those records are going to help you uh, 
prioritize when those herbicides might actually need to be used uh, as, for example, as opposed to as a burn down treatment at, compared to a post emergence treatment. In general, you scout all the time when you check the health of your crop, but for weeds, you really need to focus on scouting um, one to two weeks before planting. Uh, what kind of winter annual weeds do you need to be controlling? Uh, is, is horseweed too big to control at that time? Um, do a weed survey within three to five weeks after, after planting, after that pre-emergence herbicide has been applied, and, to, and evaluate those treatments and see if you need to apply a post-emergence treatment because without glyphosate, all the products that we're going to rely on for post-emergence weed control really need to be applied when the weeds are less than four inches tall. And then finally, do a weed survey of what's in your field before harvest, especially if you have uh, Palmer amaranth. Start clean. Um, Different ways to start clean, tillage or pre-emergence herbicide. The point is you need to stay clean for a few weeks after planting because those first three or four weeks, that's when the weeds are most competitive with the crop and that's when you're going to see the most yield loss in your field. With the exception of Palmer amaranth, if you can keep your fields clean for those first uh, three or four weeks, even if weeds come up later in the season, you're not really going to see that much of a yield hit. So as far as herbicide programs for starting clean, and corn in general, good burn down uh, Paraquat plus Atrazine or Simazine. Uh, this is good for uh, small horseweed, uh, ragweed, uh, and any Palmer amaranth or seed seedling grasses that may be emerging. However, it's not as effective if the horseweed is larger, if the horseweed is starting to bolt. Uh, Paraquat is a contact herbicide. It's not really going to be that effective on perennial weeds. It'll burn them back, but not uh, really control them completely. As, and it's not that effective on Italian ryegrass. Um, Paraquat natrazine is also effective for terminating um, that larger uh, cover crop, larger grass wheat uh, or cereal rye type cover crop, allowing you, to, uh, allowing you to get more biomass if you are going to use cover crops for weed control, and I'll discuss that in a few minutes. For soybeans, a similar program, uh, Paraquat plus metribuzin, very effective on smaller broadleaf weeds. Um, you can also add uh, 2,4-D or dicamba to improve control. Um, if you do have fields with problem winter annual weeds, you're probably going to have to apply two burn downs or a burn down and include another something else like Paraquat at, with your residual at planting um, at two, two to three week intervals. Um, for double crop soybean, we do recommend that um, if you have glyphosate, this might be something where you prioritize it for your burn down just because of there are risks, are risks with um, applying you know, Paraquat and 2,4-D at that time of the year as far as you, know, you don't want to drift these chemicals onto your neighbor's fields. Other options, um, Sharpen plus 2,4-D or dicamba is good for coarse weed control. Uh, Canopy EX plus 2,4-D is good for those winter annual weeds. Field pansy and cut leaf evening primrose. And you still have the option of uh, select and other group one herbicides for grass control. You just don't want to really want to tank mix those with a broadleaf herbicide like 2,4-D and apply select uh, two to three days before or seven days after um, you apply uh, your broadleaf herbicide, uh, 2,4-D, again, 2,4-D or dicamba. Don't neglect, neglect, neglect your residual herbicides. Uh, your burn down herbicides, glyphosate, 2,4-D, dicamba, uh, and select, they, remember, they have no residual activity. And once those weeds, your winter annual weeds, are removed from your field, that's going to create some gaps for weed emergence. Now this figure here shows a study we did um, this past summer looking at uh, common ragweed. 
we had uh, four different treatments, a uh, no burn down herbicide with a residual herbicide, a burn down herbicide with a residual herbicide, a uh, no burn down herbicide and no residual herbicide, and a burn down herbicide with no residual. And on the y-axis of this chart you see you know, the number of uh, common ragweed plants uh, four weeks after soybean planting. And where we saw the most common ragweed plants was here, where we, where we just applied a burn down treatment with no residual. So what this did was, you know, we burned off those, um, that cover crops and those winter annual weeds, and that just, you know, created a nice open canopy for ragweed to emerge. Now, if we didn't do anything, we still had some ragweed, but significantly less than just burning that, burning that cover down and, again, waiting for those and letting those plants emerge. So it is important to add that residual herbicide in. And specific residual herbicide programs for corn that we can recommend, those need to include at least atrazine and a group 15 herbicides such as dual, ma dual magnum. Again, a lot of tank mix products already have um, atrazine and dual in them, uh, Bicep, again, Acuron, uh, Lexar, and Lumax, or you can just mix your own. Um, we could also add one of those group 27 herbicides uh, like Caprino, like Corvus, or 2,4-D to help uh, improve your broadleaf control control um, of things like uh, Palmer amaranth and common ragweed. For residual herbicides programs in soy, again, recommend including at least two effective modes of action from the group 14 herbicides, your Valor and your Authority products, um, a group five, your Metribuzin, if, not, if you don't use it in your burn down treatment, you really only want to apply metribuzin once uh, during the growing season, and a group 15, uh, such as dual, warrant, or residua, or uh, a group 14, a group 5, and a group 3 herbicide like Prow. And if you are one of those unfortunate people that might have uh, PPO resistant common ragweed, you're pretty much left with something like Lorox or Command plus Metribuzin for, uh, for controlling that uh, weed pre-emergence. And always, you can also include Gramoxone with your pre-emergence herbicide if weeds are present. Uh, I've used it in particular for Palmer amaranth control. Sometimes, you know, Palmer Palmer will emerge after you've already applied your, or while you're applying your pre-emergence herbicide and you don't get as good control as you'd like. So adding gramoxone to that um, tank mix at planting um, will help to ensure that the, you start clean. Another thing I want to mention is there are a lot of premixes on the market there and you just want to check those premixes to make sure um, that they're going to give you the control you want because a lot, a lot of times these premixed herbicides um, do not have enough of a single active ingredient that's recommended uh, for controlling a particular weed. And I'm just going to pick on uh, Trivents for this example, but a lot of these premixes have the same issue. So, for example, um, the Valor label recommends applying. To about two and a half ounces for controlling uh, Palmer amaranth. The Trivance label recommends applying about 7.2 7 to 10 ounces of Trivance uh, for Palmer amaranth management. So I've got three ratios here. I've got Trivance at eight ounces, Trivance at nine ounces, and Trivance at 10 ounces. Now, at the eight ounce rate, you're applying 2.604 uh, pounds active of flumiox flumioxazin, the active ingredient in Valor, which is about two ounces. So when you're applying it at that rate, you are not applying uh, the recommended rate for Valor. 
you actually, if you apply at not, try events at nine ounces, you're applying at 2.25 ounces, you're applying 2.25 ounces of valor, you're still not at that 2.5 ounce rate yet. At 10 ounces, you're applying two and a half ounces of valor. You're applying that correct rate. However, On the Trivents label, there is language that says, do not apply a, more than a total of 4.5 ounces of active ingredient metribuzin in the central region states, which for this label includes Maryland. For 8, 9, and 10 ounces, we're applying 4.5, 5.3, and 5.9 ounces of espitolacor. So, Technically, in order to get that rate to control that two and a half ounce rate that's recommended for controlling val uh, com or pomeramorant, we would actually be going over our allotted la labeled rate for applying metribuzin. There's also language on the label that's next to the pomeramorant information that says a post-emergence herbicide such as femesophen or lactophen may be needed following a pre-emergence application for adequate control of weeds with heavy pressure and resistant biotypes. So just be aware that when you apply these pre-emergence products, um, they may or may not uh, completely control um, your uh, Palmer amaranth or your weeds f for the duration it takes for your crops to canopy and just be aware, to, again, to rely on a good pre-emergence program and an effective post-emergence program. Post-emergence programs for corn. Again, most of these products need to be sprayed when the weeds are susceptible less than four inches tall. Um, that V1 to V6 growth stages, that is when the crop needs to be weed free. So resist the urge to wait for a single flush of wheat for all of the weeds to come up before you spray. You want to keep your fields clean between that V1 and V6 stage. For post products, include your group 27 herbicides, your HPPD inhibitors, plus atrazine. You really need to include atrazine. It's going to be more effective uh, with those uh, bleaching herbicides. You need to apply those to corn less than 12 inches tall. You cannot apply anything with atrazine over 12 inches tall. Uh, for grass control, things like Accent Q still give, give good um, post-emergence control. And also add, add that residual herbicide for additional control of uh, merging uh, grasses and small seeded broadleaf weeds. However, I have said that we need to include atrazine in our burn down or atrazine in our pre emergence program as well as our post emergence program. Just be aware that there still is a limit to, to how much atrazine you can apply in one year. Um, it's still at uh, 2.5 pounds total uh, for a year, two pounds in a single application. The good thing is about adding atrazine in your post-emergence application is you only need about half a pound of atrazine for it to synergize with one of those group 15 herbicides, uh, Callisto, Impact, or Armazon. Um, if you're um, applying something like an Acuron product or a Lumax Lexar that's going to have uh, Lisatrione and Esmetolachlor, just be aware of what you've applied your, for your pre-program and what you've applied for your post-program because you are limited to uh, 0.24 pounds of uh, a Callisto-type product and about 3.71 pounds of a dual-type product uh, per year. Post-herbicide programs and soybeans, again, going to be most effective when the weeds are less than four inches tall. That weed-free period is going to be between the V1 and the V5 growth stages. Again, don't wait for all those weeds to emerge. You know, do your best to keep your uh, fields clean between uh, that V1 and V5 growth stages. Your post-emergence programs are really going to be trait-dependent. Um, we have Extend and Ingenia for dicamba beans, and List uh, for 2,4-D. Uh, if you're just going to plant conventional beans, you still have the options of the burner herbicide, you know, uh, Cobra, Reflex, Ultra Blazer. 
Uh, Bassagran is a good product for ragweed control. And for grasses, you still have your group one herbicide, your Assure, your Target, your Select, and post herbicide. Just be aware again, do not uh, tank mix those with uh, your broadleaf herbicides. And especially with soybeans, uh, include again that gr group 15, that uh, dual residual warrant herbicide uh, with your post emergence treatments for residual control. Um, considerations uh, for post-emergence applications. We've got a lot of new technologies on the market. We have the Enlist system and then we have the Extend system. With the Enlist system, you can spray uh, Liberty, glyphosate, or 2,4-D over the top. With the Extend system, you can spray um, dicamba, glyphosate, or Liberty over the top. Um, different cutoff dates for different herbicides. Um, the Enlist system, the 2,4-D system, has no cutoff date. Um, products registered for over-the-top applications of dicamba, uh, Tavium, Extendamax, Ingenia, still have that June 30th cutoff date. Um, another thing to note, uh, with these products, drift is a concern, so be be sure you're using the correct nozzle size. Uh, nozzles that are less prone to drift like your ultra coarse nozzles. Buffers. Buffers can be especially confusing, especially when it comes to the dicamba and 2,4-D products. How many of you have taken your required dicamba training yet? It's confusing, isn't it? Well, as far as dicamba is concerned, you have to have at least a 240 foot down when buffer do sensitive crops. If you have sensitive crops all around you, you probably can't spray dicamba on your dicamba beans because that down, you never know when that down, where that downwind buffer is going to be. The winds, you could have a nice uh, uh, cornfield right where you're spraying downwind, but the wind could shift into a non-dicamba bean type field. So just be aware of where, if you have dicamba beans, be aware of where your buffer restriction is going to be. Again, dicamba can be a very tricky herbicide. If you're planning on planting dicamba beans, you might want to get with your neighbor and see if they're going to plant those beans as well. Because if anything else is around you that's not dicamba beans, there's a really there's a strong risk of you know unpleasantness if your herbicide were to drift on their fields. Now with uh, 2,4-D uh, or Enlist products, there's still a buffer restriction, but that's only a 30 feet buffer restriction. And another thing about the dicamba uh, buffer restriction, that's a minimum 240 feet. It goes up to about 310 feet if you happen to have a uh, endangered species listed in the area. Some other considerations for uh, post-emergence control. If you do need to spray a larger weeds, um, they are going to requ require uh, multiple applications or tank mixtures to control. Either sequential applications of 2,4-D or dicamba applied at seven to 10 day intervals for things like common ragweed and Palmer amaranth, or mixtures of 2,4-D uh, plus glyphosate or glufosinate. Uh, this is a study I did looking at uh, common ragweed control, uh, larger common ragweed control, ragweed that was either about six to 12 inches tall or about 14 to 18 inches tall. And I looked at different herbicide mixes um, Roundup alone for a uh, glyphosate resistant common ragweed population. Um, Enlist 1, 2,4-D, uh, Liberty alone, Roundup plus 2,4-D, Roundup plus Liberty, 2,4-D uh, plus Liberty, or a three-way tank mix of Roundup plus 2,4-D plus Liberty. And what we saw was, as far as control, when we sprayed our applications at the small, or the smaller weeds, I'll say, the six to 12 inch weeds, 
Um, we got 95 to 100% control with our Enlist 1 uh, and our combinations of Roundup plus Enlist 1 and Roundup plus Liberty. However, when the, that ragweed grew larger to about 14 to 18 inches, we saw a significant decline in um, the level of control with those large weeds. So, it is possible to control uh, larger weeds with tank mixes. However, even tank mixes aren't going to overcome those issues when those weeds get too tall. And I do have a couple uh, fact sheets back on the table. We just published one about controlling uh, large palmer amaranth and common ragweed and corn and soybean. If you'd like one of those, uh, come up and see me and I'll, and I'll be sure to get you one. And again, Another thing, as weed size increases, uh, control, of course, will decrease with those herbicides. And the rates we use were not considered to be a lethal dose. A lethal, uh, the rates on the label are recommended um, for a specific weed size. You cannot go above the label rate. And if we're not applying a lethal dose, there is a uh, stronger likelihood that, you know, just spraying that sublethal dose is going to result in uh, greater herbicide-resistant weeds. And as I said, we are very lucky that we only have Palmer that's resistant to uh, group 2 herbicides and glyphosate. We really need to um, conserve those effective modes of action that we already have. I want to talk about a little bit about optimizing glyphosate performance because, again, it's going to be in short supply this year, so we want to make the most out of our money. So use the correct glyphosate rate based on formulation and weed size. In general, glyphosate products go from having about three pounds of the active ingredient of glyphosate to about five pounds. Now, in general, um, about you know, 32 ounces of Buccaneer would be your standard rate. But if you have a glyphosate formulation with a higher load, such as Glystar Plus or Touchdown, um, you won't really only need to apply 22 ounces or 20 ounces with the Touchdown High Tech type product to get the same effective rate. So just be aware of that. Don't just rely on all glyphosate products I'm going to apply 32 ounces an acre. If you have a, a higher load, you can apply less. If you have a lower load, you're going, you're going to have to apply more. Water quality. Um, do you recommend adding ammonium sulfate um, before a, applying glyphosate to negate those hard water issues? Um, you can do this with most anything except dicamba. You cannot apply ammonium sulfate with a glyphosate and dicamba mixture. And also, um, some glyphosate products come fully loaded, uh, some not, some don't. So just um, consult the label for additional adjuvants and tank mixtures that may be required. Spray coverage. Even with glyphosate, we still recommend that we apply this herbicide to small weeds, three to four inches weeds. Um, at, so you're going to have to use about, you know, only 10 to 15 gallons per acre on those small weeds. But you do have, will have to increase your spray volume to about 15 to 20 gallons per acre on large weeds. So again, smaller weeds are going to help you save some herbicide. Environment, be aware with what's around you. If you're spraying glyphosate and you kick up, and your tractor's kicking up a lot of dust, that dust is going to bind to those glyphosate particles and it's not going to be as effective. Avoid spraying glyphosate when the plants are stressed. Glyphosate's a systemic herbicide. It needs to move throughout the plant with all the, other, with all the water and other nutrients that are going to move throughout that plant. If the plants are stressed, none of that's going to be moving through the plant and glyphosate's not going to be moving through the plant. There's also a 30 minute rain fast period, so you know, don't, apply, don't spray right before it rains. Optimizing glufosinate or Liberty performance. Time of the day. Very, very effective wind spraying li Liberty. 
You can spray, if you spray Liberty when it's hot, about 50 plus degrees, sunny and humid, you're going to get more out of, more out of that herbicide. Uh, in general, spraying between the times of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And with Liberty, there is a longer rain fast period, of about four hours compared to half hour of glyphosate. Spray coverage. Liberty is a contact herbicide, so you definitely need to spray these weeds when they're less than four inches tall. Um, at, that, at a higher spray volume of about 15 to 20 gallons per acre with something that's going to produce medium to coarse droplet nozzles. And we also at, do recommend adding ammonium sulfate um, with uh, glufosinate. Tank mix considerations for, glypho, for glufosinate. One of the things you want to do is, if you mix something like 2,4-D with uh, glufosinate, you want to treat that as a Liberty application with uh, glyphosate or 2,4-D as the additive. That, what that means is you just need to apply you know, the volume per acre that you would apply for Liberty at 15 to 20 volume per acre rate rather than a 10 to 15 volume per acre rate that you would apply with uh, glyphosate. And with Liberty as glyphosate as well, you do want to include, the, remember to include those residual herbicides with that post-emergence application. This is a field of um, soybeans with Palmer amaranth. And what this gr grower did was he just kept applying Liberty to control that Palmer. And as you can see, not very effective. You will actually save more money if you apply Liberty and something like Dual in a one-class application than just relying on going to spray the field several times with just a Liberty or just a post-emergence herbicide with no residual. If you cannot find glyphosate or glufosinate, there are a lot of products out there that already have it in pre-mixed. Uh, for glyphosate, I already mentioned Acuron GT, Callisto, Enlist, Enlist Duo is glyphosate and 2,4-D, um, Expert, Fallow, Flexstar, all of those products already have glyphosate in that tank mix. Um, glufosinate, products like Cheetah Max, Senate, Intermock, which I mentioned earlier is the mixture of uh, glufosinate and uh, esmetolachlor or dual. Finally, uh, integrate non-chemical weed control tactics in, into your program. Um, crop rotation. A lot of us already do this, either uh, corn and soybean rotation at minimum. You know, that's going to give you fair control of your weeds. It's going to allow you to plan your programs based on different planting and harvesting dates, which are going to be affected by, you know, what weeds are going to emerge from that time. For example, you know, common ragweed, more of a problem in corn because it's an early emerging summer annual weed and it's going to be more competitive with that corn crop. Allows you to have different herbicide programs. Palmer amaranth. It's a lot easier to control in corn than it, than it is in soybean. We have a lot more effective chemistries for controlling Palmer amaranth in corn. Allows you to control weeds based on row spacing and fertility management as well. So in general, again, corn, soybeans, a fair rotation for weed control. That rotation gets better if you add a corn uh, small grain that can be either a wheat cash crop or a small grain cover crop followed by a soybean rotation. If you're able to, a corn, uh, wheat, soybean rotation followed by a couple years and pasture forage like alfalfa um, will uh, even uh, pr prove that control uh, even better. Another thing you want to do for um, uh, an integrated, from an integrated weed, weed management standpoint is target the seeds. Um, Italian ryegrass, horseweed, common ragweed, and uh, palmer amaranth don't emerge from very deep in the soil. Italian ryegrass, you know, the, up to the first half inch, horseweed, 0.2 inches, common ragweed, larger seed, a uh, little bit deeper from two inches, Palmer amaranth, one to two inches. So if you can find an effective way to bury these seeds or to prevent light from reaching the soil surface to stimulate germination, um, 
you're going to go a long way to improving your weed control program. Now, one way to target the seeds is, of course, through tillage. Some people t t like to do it, some people don't. But the efficacy of any tillage operation is really going to depend on the species, the method, and the timing of tillage. Italian ryegrass, you know, you can use fall tillage to help bury, bury those seeds greater than four inches deep. However, any type of tillage operation now for Italian, Italian ryegrass is just going to be futile, futile because all that Italian ryegrass has emerged and you're basically just going to turn over these clumps and move them elsewhere. For horseweed, uh, fall or spring disc, uh, chisel, or even a mold board plow is going to be effective in burying those seeds. However, uh, any type of vertical tillage implements not going to be effective for those emerged plants. Um, common ragweed. Um, something like moldboard plowing every four years or in, in a row cultivation is going to be effective. Um, chisel, disc, any type of chisel, disc, rototilling, it's just going to simply uh, bring those seeds to the surface. Um, and the same thing with Palmer amaranth. In this figure here, we looked at the impact of tillage systems on Palmer amaranth emergence over three years. We did three types of tillage treatments with a pre-emergence herbicide and without a pre-emergence herbicide. We looked at spring tillage, either disking or rototilling, uh, no tillage, or a one-time fall more, more plow. And what we saw was when we didn't include a pre-emergence herbicide, these yellow bars, we saw a whole lot more Palmer amaranth plants emerge in those spring till treatments versus our no-till treatments and fall moldboard plow treatments. However, if we did apply a pre-emergence herbicide, you know, it really we really saw no significant differences in the amount of Palmer amaranth that emerging. Bottom line, for things like common ragweed and Palmer amaranth, if you are till tilling your fields, um, you actually are stimulating the growth of those weeds and stimulating the germination of those weeds. So you really want to, you know, kind of stick to that no-till situation um, where you've got a lot of cover on the ground. Now if you have a large populations of Palmer amaranth, as I said before, you know, a one-time fall moldboard plow just to, every four years just to bury that seed um, is going to be effective because that seed's not going to last very long in the soil seed bank, only about uh, three years. And once you've moldboard plowed, you can always um, you know, plant a cover crop on top of that um, to help get uh, your soil health back. Aside from tillage, um, keeping it no-till, you can increase sh shading by uh, planting a grass cover crop. You know, these grass cover crops, like cereal rye, are going to comp compete with those winter annual weeds. and. If you optimize the biomass uh, delay termination to about two to three weeks um, before planting, um, you're going to get a lot of what we call lignified tissue or basically a mulch layer of uh, cereal rye. Now we do recommend for things like Palmer amaranth to include one of these you know, heavy biomass producing crops like cereal rye as opposed to hairy vetch because once you terminate that cover crop, you still want to have that mulch layer on the ground. Since your legume crops like hairy vetch, clovers, are mostly leaf tissue, once you kill them, they're going to desiccate and again open up that canopy for those weeds to emerge. For termination, I alluded to this earlier. Um, if you're going to use a cover crop to, in your weed management program, you really need to terminate it later. You can use germoxone um, at the after the boot stage. This will optimize biomass production and still let you terminate that cover crop. If you are not going to, uh, if you just want to terminate your cover crop early, you can use Select or any other type of grass cover crop or grass herbicide, excuse me. However, just be aware that terminating your cover crop early, like now or in a few weeks, is not going to provide you that summer annual weed suppression. 
narrow spacing, especially when it comes to soybeans. Again, these species are not very shade tolerant. Um, planting in 15 inch rows versus 30 inch rows is going to allow for quick, quicker canopy closure. And once that happens, you know, no, lots, no sunlight reaching the soil surface, um, uh, less likelihood that those weeds are going to emerge. Another thing that we've seen with reduced uh, narrow row spacing is there is reduced Palmer biomass and seed production. And this figure here, here we see Palmer amaranth from a soybean field planted in seven and a half inch rows. The middle one is our 15 inch rows and this far end is our 30 inch rows. So even though we still had Palmer amaranth in this field, you see a lot less seed production from our seven and a half and our 15 inch rows compared to our 30 inch rows. And last but not least, uh, manage escapes. You know, follow up on your weed control programs. Uh, check uh, seven to 10 days after you sprayed your uh, pre-emergence program, your post-emergence program. And prevent seed movement, especially, especially, especially with Palmer amaranth. Escapes need to be hand pulled. Um, spraying a herbicide on this, on this plant late in the season, not going to do anything to prevent seed production. Those seeds have already been produced. You're basically just wasting your money spraying this weed. Consider the, and consider the economics of infesting fields heavy, uh, with heavy infestations of uh, Palmer amaranth. Um, for example, this was a soybean field out in Do Dorchester County and I challenge you to find enough soybeans in this field to get a good yield. So this is a good example of you're not going to get any soybeans out of it. There is no point in driving a combine through this field to, and spreading the seeds and making the problems worst. If you do have Palmer, hopefully it's not very much. Harvest those weed-free areas first and then come in and harvest the infested areas last and then clean that combine before moving it into other fields. The combine, because not only can the combine spread weeds, but you can also get some Palmer amaranth you know, seeds uh, in that grain truck. So this is a photo from Jim Lewis in Caroline County. You can see those few tiny, tiny seeds you know, in that grain truck. And where is that grain truck going? It's driving out of the field, it's driving by your fields, and it's probably spreading more Palmer. So again, harvest weed seed control, preventing the movement of this, this species is very important. So take home messages, you know, start clean, use effective burn down or um, herbicides or tillage. You really want to target those seeds of our uh, more concerning weeds. You know, implement multiple effective herbicides and optimize that shading. Um, bury them, um, keep them out of the sun. Optimize those herbicide applications. Um, scout, make sure you're applying it to small weeds. Um, incorporate those multiple herbicide groups for resistance management and include residual herbicides and again manage those escapes. Now a couple things I'm going to plug. We will be having an integrated weed, a series of integrated weed management workshops um, both here and in Virginia. Um, we will be having one at the Southersville Fire Department on March 14th from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. We will also be having um, a virtual Zoom meeting on March 24th from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, these workshops are free. Um, I have some flyers in the back. Um, if you want to scan this QR code now, um, you can register or you can grab one of those flyers. Um, as Jenny mentioned, uh, some people were lucky enough to get a new copy of the Mid-Atlantic Weed Management Guide. Um, University of Maryland Extension does not sell these, but you do can obtain one from uh, Penn State, the Penn State Publications Office. I also have flyers back there. It's the same one as the uh, Integrated weed, weed Management Workshop flyer. Um, scan the QR code or go to this web address. It's the same price as last year. 
It's ten dollars for a hard copy, eighteen or eight dollars for an enhanced PDF, or you can bundle the PDF and hard copy. One of the good things about um, this weed control guide is we do have efficacy tables in the guide with um, different weeds that might be in your field, where you can compare. Um, uh, I've got this. What's this? How effective is this herbicide going to be on it? Another thing we do have available from our extension website is our spray tank last check charts for both soybeans and corn. Just a list of uh, tank of products that you really want to ha consider having um, for your burn down, your residual, and your post applications for uh, mare's tail, um, common ragweed, and Palmer amaranth. We also have these efficacy of weed management tactics tables. Um, this is similar to um, our herbicide efficacy tables in the weed management guides, except for this. Um, this tells us how effective some of those different integrated weed management tactics, like cover cropping and row spacing and a harvest, weed, weed, harvest weed seed control are gonna be um, for weed management of specific species. Additional resources, um, the I Will Take Action website, good resources for you know, looking at your tank mix products, making sure you're using multiple effective sites of action, and the Grow IWM website, constantly being updated with uh, new videos and as far as updates on our research for all these different integrated weed management tactics. Um, the Enlist Duo, Extendamax, and Ingenia labels, just be aware that there are, again, a lot of restrictions for those labels, and you do want to visit those websites before you plan to apply any of these herbicides. And with that, thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Good morning, everybody. Um, I see a lot of faces out there that we do business with, either on the crop insurance platform or on the grain platform. And I just want you to know how grateful we are for your, for your loyalty and for your customer uh, attention. Um, it's, a, it's a volatile time out there. It's interesting. I was standing in the back there, and there's uh, in that book of uh, the table of freebies. Is the yearbook of agriculture, 1988. Marketing U.S. Agriculture, Chapter 1, Marketing in a Changing World. Now, isn't that poignant? Um, but I want you to know the commitment that Nagels has to walk through these challenging times with you. Uh, we're, we're partners in growing and marketing a crop uh, worldwide, and um, the, the, the volatility that's out there, both in uh, the marketing, the uh, supply chain, uh, there's a lot of risk. And one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is, is take advantage of your crop insurance guarantees that are at, at a, almost a record high this year, um, largely the result of, of increased economic uh, progress, but very lately um, what's going on in the Ukraine. And it, it's, it's made the, 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 crop, the crop marketing kind of like the wild, wild west. And um, those people are just like us. They're, they're farmers. They got wheat in the ground that um, they're going to try to grow a crop from, but they have sons and they have daughters. Uh, they have farms. They have family ties. And I just like, I'm going to stop talking here. I just like to take a moment of silence in thinking about those people that are just like us. I want you guys to be safe this spring. In spite of all the challenges and the, the risk that's in, around, just pay attention to what you're doing and be really careful because uh, Everybody in this room is really valuable to everybody else, and we just thank you for your, your business, and we thank you for your relationships. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, again, Darren Alice, MDE's uh, Animal Feeding Operations Division. So I oversee um, our permitting and inspection units. Many of you, or some of you, may have been um, have had visits in the past from our inspectors, Dave Bramble or Richard Stewart or perhaps Brennan Green. Um, but basically, I came over uh, to MDE from MDA uh, with nutrient management, um, had been there for 22 years. I had the area up in uh, Baltimore, Hartford, and Cecil County, so uh, Howard Callahan's counterpart. So pretty well um, adaptive, you know, as far as you know, working with operators, um, you know, talking to groups. 
So um, again, a couple things I did want to bring up. We're, we're in closely uh, contact with MDA uh, for any uh, potential developments with uh, high path AI. So we're definitely uh, in uh, regular communication and keeping tabs on that. So uh, hopefully uh, you know, things will, will smooth out. But um, also the other thing I did, well, a couple other things. Um, <laughs> Uh, the annual implementation reports. I know Howard will be speaking about that later on, but uh, if you have any questions that are AFA related, um, please contact our office. We can certainly uh, help you out. We have Sarah and Kate. Uh, they can certainly help you out with any questions specific for AFO information on those reports. And the other thing is um, I wanted to mention is not really related to our program, but we do have an ag uh, scrap tire uh, program, another uh, a division of ours at MDE, and I do have some information on the display table I have in the back as far as some different dates. There's one in Elkton for those in Cecil County, and then there's one in Ridgely for Caroline, Kent, Queen Anne's, and Talbot counties. So if you have any um, old tires, ag related, they will accept them on these dates. I have, again, it's on the display table I have in the back, so just be aware of that. Um, again, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, Come see me. I'll be here for today, and I uh, uh, hope uh, we can work together. So thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, well, thanks, Jenny. You used my opening line. <laughs> so most, most importantly, I am a farmer. Uh, so I uh, 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 see a lot of, uh, of faces in the room here that I recognize. Uh, uh, you know, uh, many years ago, as a, as a beginning farmer, I recognized that there was a lot of decisions that were made that impacted uh, whether I could make a living in this business or not. Uh, decisions made by people that were a long, long ways away from the end of my driveway. So it kind of gave me an, an inspiration to get involved, uh, to be able to start showing up at meetings and speaking up at meetings and, and volunteering time to be a farmer leader. Uh, so for 10 years, I uh, represented uh, Maryland soybean farmers on the uh, National Board of Directors of the American Soybean Association. Uh, ended up being the national president for American Soybean Association in 2016. And now I, uh, I'm a part-time uh, uh, hat wearer doing the executive director uh, work for the Mid-Atlantic Soybean Association, which, which Maryland soybean farmers are a part of. So I, I want, before uh, Jenny gives me the hook, I want to make sure that I give you the greatest opportunity that you're going to find today and that's to get uh, five units of soybean seed for $210. Thanks to the wonderful partnerships that we have with seed companies such as Asgro, Pioneer, Hubner, uh, Channel, uh, and the, um, uh, uh, I, I see the, the uh, um, uh, consultants, the, uh, the uh, uh, other company. So they're willing to, uh, to uh, I'll give you a certificate for five units of soybean seed in exchange for becoming a new member or renewing your existing membership in the Soybean Association. That's a $210 dues. You get five units of soybean seed. We all know that five units of soybean seed is worth more than $210. And if you do it today while you're here, you'll get an entry uh, into a, a, a drawing for a 55 quart lifetime uh, cooler. Uh, that we'll do a drawing uh, for here at the end of the, of the event today. Um, so I just came back from, uh, from Washington. I was in Washington for three days this week. I had a very good luncheon with uh, Representative G.T. Thompson uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we had lunch together. He's the ranking Republican member of the House Agriculture Committee. Uh, so you know, we talked about what he's hoping that he's going to be able to do once he gets to gavel next year. Uh, to shepherd in the 2023 Farm Bill. So lots of, uh, as, as Mark Nagel, he, Mark's a member of our Mid-Atlantic Board of Directors, so as, as uh, Mark Sultanfuss uh, so correctly put it, there's a lot of volatility going on. Uh, rest assured that your farmer leaders and, and Farm Bureau, as well as the Soybean Association, the corn growers, all of us that are in that barnyard, what we call the barnyard together, you know, we're working to protect uh, farmers, to, to uh, express the voices of farmers, uh, working with, uh, with all administrations, both here domestically as well as internationally, uh, to get you access for American agricultural products into as many 
uh, markets as we can around the world. So thank you for your contributions to what you do, and I'll be happy to talk to you and give you that certificate. Thanks much. Thank you.